bless the world. It's as simple as telling people what Jesus has done for you. What was your life like before Christ? How did you accept Christ? How has your life been different since you trusted Christ? I'm thankful for Kissimmee and others who have shared their story. And as we talk about blessing the world, it's as simple as going and telling the story of how you have been blessed by the Lord and the salvation he has given you. Hospitality is Christianity on offense. Hospitality is Christianity on offense. Uh, my wife and I, well, let me just start by saying eating. Like this is a sermon I, it's easy for me to preach, okay? I love to eat. Right now my wife and I are doing this diet called the Whole30. Very simply, if it tastes good, spit it out, okay? <laughs> so I am, I am doing uh, a lot of thinking about February the 15th. That's when we're off the Whole30, and what's that meal going to be? Is it going to be chips and salsa and fajitas, not worried about what it's cooked in? Is it going to be Chinese food? Uh, what's that going to be? Is it going to be a greasy hamburger? I don't know. We love to eat. We love to eat. Most of us love to eat. And as you think about life, you think about how listening and eating go hand in hand. Think about how many conversations you have around the dinner table. It's kind of like peanut butter and jelly. It just, it goes together. And so imagine a world that's transformed by people eating together. Imagine a neighborhood. Imagine a community that's transformed simply by people eating together. Welcome to another week in our series on Bless the World. In week one, we talked about living questionable lives. The way we live, we want to live different. We're called to live different. That invokes questions in the life of unbelievers and our neighbors. In week two, we talked about uh, beginning with prayer. That's how Jesus began his earthly ministry. He went away, he began with prayer. And so we talked about praying for opportunities to share the gospel and to build relationships and to listen to people. Because listen was week two. Just the art of listening, the way we can show love to people, by lending an ear. And this morning, we're going to talk about eating. I'm grateful to Dave and John Ferguson and their work and their book uh, called Bless, uh, the Bless model, which I believe is adapted straight from the ministry of Jesus. And I'm thankful to their work as we've provided insight, they've provided insight for us as we've gone through this series. So Matthew chapter 9 is where we're going to be uh, this morning. The strongest power of eating together comes from the ministry of Jesus. The strongest power for the ministry of eating together comes from Jesus. Throughout Scripture, you will see Jesus eating with people. You think about his ministry, you probably think about his teaching You think about his healing, you think about his miracles, but you also need to think in your mind about his meals. Because the meals of Jesus demonstrate a lot about his work and what he came to do. Because when you look closer, you see that central to his ministry was sitting down and having a meal with people. His first miracle in the Gospel of John was a miracle at a wedding feast. A wedding in Cana. One of his most well-known feedings and miracles was the feeding of the 5,000 that you see in John chapter 14. Uh, The night before his crucifixion, which we're going to touch on in a few moments, he brought together his closest friends for a meal, what we know as the Last Supper. Uh, After the resurrection, he came to his disciples on the shore at the Sea of Galilee, and he shared breakfast with them. Eating is central to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Dave Ferguson makes this comment. He says, in Jesus' culture, eating was a big deal. It was a statement of friendship. It was affirmation of a person's value, integrity, and worth. Who you ate with indicated who you loved and considered to be a part of your social class. So it's with that context in mind, let's stand as we read from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. 
While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Verse 12, on hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, one of the scandalous things about Jesus' ministry to the religious leaders was that he frequently ate with the lowest and most hated people of the day. Okay, he frequently ate with the lowest and most hated people of the day. Think about that in our day, okay? Respected rabbis didn't eat with those who were not part of the good people group, okay? <laughs> and so here we have Matthew. We learn about Matthew here. He's a tax collector. In the eyes of the, most of the Jewish people, they considered tax collectors to be the scum of the earth. They, they worked for the Roman Empire. Most Jewish uh, considered them traitors because they made money by overcharging their own people. Imagine that. Think about how that would be for you. They, they were seen, but they were rarely spoken to. And they certainly were not somebody a good rabbi would share a meal with. You know what Jesus said to Matthew? He said, follow me. That wasn't come aside and let's get a talking to. I'm, it was a call to discipleship. And, and notice what Jesus does is he calls him to discipleship. It wasn't to enroll Matthew in a class. Classes are great. But it wasn't to enroll him in a class. That wasn't the first thing that was done. What did he do? The first thing he did, verse 10 tells us, he came to eat. He came to eat. And so Matthew notes who all was there, tax collectors and sinners. And that term sinner was kind of a catch-all day in Jesus' day and age to term anybody who wasn't religious, anybody involved in some kind of illicit lifestyle, think prostitution. This meal at Matthew's home was a, was a collection of socially unacceptable people. It wasn't the who's who list, Okay. And here they are, and it's Jesus' initiation, and he's eating. Jesus' ministry was scandalous. It was offensive. It was, it was questioned, and the Pharisees, who were the, the super uber religious group of the day, they were, they were wondering, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? I mean, they're asking a question. Remember, we talked about living questionable lives. Here they are asking a question, and they're trying to discredit Jesus because of who he hangs out with. And we read the why. Jesus gives it. He says, on hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I'd love to know exactly how Jesus said that. That could have been videoed so we could have that, that how he said it. Maybe he even said it with food in his mouth. I don't know. But the, the, sick, the sick need a doctor, and he certainly wasn't implying that the Pharisees were healthy. Jesus came to be with people, and he was on a mission with his life. And the, the Pharisees were famous. They, they knew the Old Testament law inside and out. They, they had it backwards. They had it forward. They had it down, but they ignored the people. And so Jesus is quoting the Old Testament when he said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You see, the Pharisees had a priority, and it was obedience to laws, to man-made laws at that. But Jesus had a priority, and it was to bless people, to bless people. He came to show them grace. He came to show them mercy. Jesus was on a mission with his life. And in Luke, we get more details. Luke gives us a little more details about uh, the scandalous and questioned nature of Jesus' ministry. 
Because it was said of Jesus and Luke that the Son of Man came eating and drinking. And you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. Of course, Jesus was not glutton and he certainly was no drunkard. But he also frequently ate with people so much that he was accused of it. Guilt by association. Yet for Jesus, that didn't stop him. And the fear of questions and the religious leaders and what they might do or what they might say or how they might make him live in fear didn't, didn't stop him. Because for Jesus, eating with people was essential to his mission of seeking and saving people. In the book of Revelation, we hear, we read about the great feast. Jesus uses that analogy when talking about the kingdom when he comes along. Eating is a part of his ministry. He blessed and he loved people. How? One of the ways was that he shared meals with them. Hospitality is Christianity on offense. Think about the high school cafeteria. I was thinking about mine a few days ago. Kind of a painful thought to think of looking back, but you have the, the popular table, and you have the, if your high school was like mine, you have the athletic table, and uh, the cheerleaders, and the nerds, and uh, maybe, maybe some that feel like they're outcasts, all these different tables. And naturally, in a cafeteria, naturally in society, and in our schools, we're going to go where people often look like us, are going to make us feel co- the most comfortable. Who we eat with often marks the boundaries of who we will or will not associate with. Who you eat with says something about who you love. The table of Jesus was different than the world's table. The table of Jesus was different than the world's table. It was a great equalizer because Jesus wasn't interested in all of these different dividing lines that that people had. Jesus came to cross those barriers of exclusion. He was willing to offend his own because at Jesus' table, everybody was equal. Eating has a way of letting the guard down. You know, it was in the upper room Jesus, outside of Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, shared the the, the Passover meal with his disciples. And he used that Passover meal as a teaching lesson for his disciples, a very sacred lesson. As he shared the bread, he he told his body would would be beaten, stabbed, bruised, hung on a tree. He used the wine to represent his blood that would be spilled and poured out. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright says this about Jesus. When Jesus himself wanted to explain to his disciples what his forthcoming death was all about, he didn't give them a story, he gave them a meal. He gave them a meal. This is how you're going to remember. This is how I'm going to teach you what's happening. Jesus died For all people, he died to redeem. He died to reconcile. Jesus came for sick people, and he invites all of us to share at his table of grace, forgiveness, and blessing. And it was in the upper room that Jesus blessed his friends and followers with an act of service that stunned everyone present. A meal. Henry Nouwen said this, when we invite friends for a meal... We do much more than offer them food for their bodies. We offer friendship, fellowship, good conversation, intimacy, and closeness. We talked about living questionable lives a couple weeks ago. And the truth that Jesus' life, his ministry, was questioned called into question. We've talked about beginning with prayer. We've talked about the importance of prayer and the Holy Spirit in leading us where the Holy Spirit would want us to go. And when we talk about eating, it can be very easy and tempting to come up with all sorts of excuses about why we can't do it, why we don't have time to do it, why it's really uncomfortable in our culture to do it. So I want to just walk through real quick some of the excuses. Let's talk with them, talk about them, and then think about ways in which we might overcome some of those excuses, okay? Because as you can see, eating was absolutely critical to Jesus' ministry. And so if we want to be a blessing in the world, 
The good news is it's going to involve food. The challenging news is that it's going to involve some conversation with people who might look, talk, smell, think different than you and me. And that's where we grow. That's how we become a blessing. So excuse number one, I don't like to have people in my home. I don't like to have people in my home. Maybe you think, well, I'm just not much of a cook. It's kind of embarrassed. I don't even like to eat my own food, much less cook for somebody else. Or I don't feel good about the way my house looks. You know, it's okay. Probably we all live pretty similarly anyway, <laughs> truth be told. Uh, but if that's an excuse, then you know what? Eat out. Meet at a, meet at a restaurant that you, uh, you, you like and you enjoy and you would love to go to. Maybe you say, I, I can't cook. Uh, order in. Lot, pretty much every uh, restaurant in the community will deliver or take out or something. You, you can think, think creatively about that. Or, you know, Pioneer Drive has a, a meal every Wednesday night. We'd love to have new people around the table there. Invite a friend and meet them up here. And uh, it's a great deal and it's great food. So there's ways around that. You don't like to have people in my home. There's other ways to share a meal with somebody. Excuse number two, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. You know, you know for many, <laughs> the thought of sitting across from a stranger uh, or, or just somebody we don't know very well or maybe we know sees life different than, than us can be very intimidating, and I understand that. I understand that. So let's, let's think about how we can overcome that for for, for a second, because so many I, I meet with, I saw this when I did college ministry, uh, when I first started here at Pioneer Drive, we will avoid awkwardness like the plague. We don't like that silence, we don't like that moment of not knowing what to say, I, I get it, but I would just challenge us in saying that awkward feeling is oftentimes the space where the spirit begins to work. And if we avoid that, we're going to miss out on, on the blessing that we could be a part of, but we're going to miss out on what God might want to do in somebody's, not just their day, but their eternity. So, so we've got to learn to embrace the awkwardness, okay? That's just part of it. That's part of it. Some, I realize, are more natural at conversation than others. But instead of worrying about what you can say, remember back to what we talked about last week. Remember last week we talked about listening and the importance of listening, go into the conversation with those four H's. What are the four H's? The history. Tell me your story. Most people can talk for a while about their story. Tell me your story. You can share your story. Uh, heart, what is your favorite? Food, vacation, uh, places in Abilene, places in Texas, whatever it may be. What, what's your favorite? Uh, habits, what are you into? What are the things that when you don't have something you have to do, where does your mind gravitate? Hurts, how are you doing with? What do you think about this? There's ways to, to come in with questions, to even go in, in your mind, having kind of bullet pointed those four H's right in your head so that when you get into that situation, you don't go, well, which way am I going? I'm just, history, tell me your story. Heart, tell me something you really enjoy. Habits, what are the things you're into? Hurts, what are you doing? How are you doing with this? Don't worry about having the perfect words to say. Because if we've been praying and we've been listening and we're grounded in Scripture, what's going to happen is the Holy Spirit, if we're willing, the Holy Spirit is going to give us eyes, ears, and a mouth to be able to say what needs to be said in that moment. So we show up and we listen and we engage we set the sail, and the Holy Spirit moves us where the Holy Spirit wants us to go. You've been praying about it. You've been listening for the Spirit. So when we get in that moment, don't be worried about what you're going to say. Just be worried about being present and trust that the Spirit will say exactly what needs to be said. Excuse number three, I don't have time. <laughs> Many of us can barely eat with our own families. This seems impossible, and preacher, that sounds great. I don't have time for it. Fair. But again, if something was that important to Jesus, and we don't have time for it, maybe we're the ones that have some priorities out of line. Okay? 
But I, I want you to think about this. Think about it this way. Eating is already on your schedules. It's on mine, trust me. We probably eat two to three meals a day. And if you eat two to three meals a day, that's like 21 times a week. Can you find one meal to share with someone out of 21? One out of 21. It's going to take effort. It may be an early breakfast. It may be a lunch. It may be a dinner. I get it. I love a good quiet night at home too. But sharing a meal is powerful. Jesus did it. And, and, and we're getting practical here. And I know for some of you, I just, I know that anxiety might be rising a little bit in your own heart, in your own chest right now. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I want to do this. But remember, it was Jesus' strategy, and he's going to help you. He's going to help you do it. And, and if you want to make a difference in the world, you want to bless the world, if you're a believer, you've been called to it. This is an opportunity to do exactly that. Here, here's some other just ideas you could do. If, it, if the one-on-one seems too intimidating, then, then maybe you invite several neighbors over for a cookout. Maybe you host a block party. Have something for kids to do. Be creative. Uh, maybe you just think, well, I just, there's a few people I know really well. They're believers, but there's maybe one or two people on my street I don't know well, don't know where they are. What I, maybe you just start with bringing them a dessert. Showing up at their front door, introducing yourself. Hi, I'm so-and-so. If it, were, if it was on my street, I would be, I was remiss. When you moved in, we didn't, I just wanted to come and make sure I, you, you, knew, you know who I am and see where that conversation goes. But but start by bringing them something. Maybe you would say, you know, seems intimidating just to have a couple people over. Maybe I just invite one other neighbor to jump in with me, and then we invite some other neighbors or one other neighbor couple over. Or maybe it's not a neighbor, but you get a friend to partner with you. Maybe you would say, our Sunday school class. Maybe our Sunday school classes could could think about and pray about where to have different groups meeting in homes and where, how they could help each other reach out to their neighbors. But picturing a week when you think about one or two meals are set aside to be with someone else, to bless other people. Imagine a world where people are sitting together, people are eating together, people are laughing and people are listening and, and, and people are talking. You see, I think that's a picture of what God wants to do because remember, hospitality is how Christianity plays offense and you don't have to do it alone. You can get other people, get other good friends, other believers to, to help you or to brainstorm uh, with you. Sharing a meal, Alan Hirsch says this, sharing a meal is one of the most sacred practices we engage in as believers. That's what Jesus, that's what Jesus did so often. And I think there's going to be food in heaven, and I think we're going to have a wonderful feast in heaven. Is there any other way to explain why as humans we have over 10,000 taste buds? You know, God didn't have to create us with recurring appetites and the ability to, to satisfy that appetite with such delight. Food is a gift of God, amen? It is a grace. God created us to need to eat and to do it together. Imagine the difference if every believer invited someone into their home or made an appointment outside their home but to share a meal with somebody. Our world would be radically different. Imagine if 500 in Abilene did it. Imagine if just 10. It'll make a difference. So if this seems challenging to you, and it is to me, okay, but if this seems challenging to you, I want you to wrestle with this question because it's a really important question, okay? If you knew the only thing standing between a neighbor or friend and eternal life was your eating dinner with them, would you do it? If that's what it took, if you knew the only thing standing between a neighbor or friend and eternal life was you're eating dinner with them, would you do it? Would you do it? A meal for a change in eternity? A meal for a change in eternity? 
So I know, you know we always wondered, how, how does this hit? And I love hearing stories of how what we're doing is, is impacting people. And truth be told, the baptisms you saw were long before we started doing this series on Bless the World. But Peter came to faith in Christ because a neighbor befriended him. And they struck up a good friendship. Adam Hall, who was baptized also this morning, Adam and his wife Kelly uh, came to us from Okinawa, Japan, about seven years ago. And they, they've gotten plugged into a Sunday school class and made a, made a difference here. Uh, Kelly was already a believer, but it wasn't until a couple years ago that Adam really trusted Christ. His eternity has been changed. His whole life has been changed. And, and I love talking with Adam Hall. You know how they got connected here at Pioneer Drive? Do you know what God used to change his life and to change his eternity? So they were new to Abilene. And Kelly was very involved in church in Japan, and, Kelly, and Adam kind of went along, and he knew it was really important to his wife. And so they were, they were sitting down for a meal here in town, and they looked over and they noticed that a couple was praying. They had just been talking about what church they needed to go to and where to find a church, and they noticed a couple praying over their meal. And so Adam, not yet a believer, but knowing the importance of church to his wife, goes over to the couple and says, hey, where do y'all go to church? I'm assuming you go to church, you prayed over your meal. And that couple said, Pioneer Drive Baptist Church. That's how Adam and Kelly found their way to Pioneer Drive. That's how they linked up with the home builders Sunday school class and some people that took them under their wing and mentored them and loved them and showed them the love of Christ. And that's how an eternity is changed. By eating a meal, by praying, and seeing what the Holy Spirit does with it. Just by praying over a meal, an invitation was extended and an eternity was changed. That's why we're doing this. So if it's uncomfortable, I get it. Man, don't you want to see people come to know Jesus? Don't you want to see people, don't you want to see our baptistry waters full every week of people coming to trust Christ? Don't you want to see the love of Jesus pouring out all over our community? Then we need to look at how he, he, he ministered. And he began with prayer. He listened to people, and he ate with them. So here's the, the call to action, and it's going to be a higher level call to action this week. Invite someone to dinner that you've never shared a meal with before. Again, it could be our Wednesday night meal. It could be a, 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 an arrangement to meet at a certain restaurant. It could be an invitation into your home. But share a meal with someone you've never shared a meal with before. And maybe you start by just sharing a meal with someone in the church you don't know. And then the next step is maybe someone in your neighborhood or your workplace that you don't know as well. Hospitality is Christianity on offense. And when we talk about all that's wrong in the world, this is how we point people to what's right in the universe, which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's go play some offense. Let's be hospitable and show people the way of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and thank you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for bringing us into your family. I thank you for the baptisms that we've witnessed this morning and uh, the lives that have been changed. And I, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would calm any anxious nerves we have about reaching out and our insecurities about that. We can be honest with you about that. And Lord, just trust your Holy Spirit that we're praying and we're listening and we're wanting to be mindful of where you would send us. So Lord, I pray for the courage to sit down and share a meal with somebody this week, to listen to them. Lord, thank you uh, that you came eating and drinking. You came to be with your people in the midst of everyday life. And in the midst of everyday life, you drew them up to the questions of eternity. You drew them to the questions of significance. You drew them to your kingdom. So may we do likewise. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.